All right, we set. So this week it's the sun. And the sun possesses human characteristics with which we can establish um, conscious relationship. The two children playing together further emphasize this human relationship. This is also a reminder that what we seek is not in a distant land, but rather is simply a new way of experiencing the world. We get into this garden not through intellectualism, but rather through imaginative play. When this sun dawns within us, it makes the entire spectrum of outer reality shine more clearly than ever before. Here the hero begins his connection to his inner child. Children often represent the inferior function, childlike and undeveloped. It is through this inferior function, which has remained spontaneous, natural, and close to the unconscious, that renewal can come. Von France said, you cannot organize the inferior function. It is awfully expensive and needs a lot of time, and that is one reason why it is such a cross in our lives, because it makes us so inefficient if we try to act to it. It has to be given whole Sundays and whole afternoons of our lifetime and nothing may come out except that the inferior function comes to life. I think nobody can really develop the inferior function before having first created a temenos, namely a sacred grove, a hidden place where he can play. Great quote by Von Franz. Children represent something newborn. They are vital, primitive, and whole. They are not self-conscious, and when we are self-conscious, we are divided, like the angry animus that criticizes every action. In this card, the children play together freely and naturally. Each is in harmony with themselves and reaches out to the other with no fear of rebuff. Coming from the heart, there is no rejection or misunderstanding. Contrast this to the two subhumans in the devil card. They wear a perpetual smirk stand stiffly apart and dare make no spontaneous moves. This is the first time we see two humans of the opposite sex naked and facing us. Prior to this, it was through another figure such as the Pope or angel or via me mechanical device, chariot, wheel, or scales. In the sun, all the opposites Male, female, spirit, flesh, soul, body can interact directly in a, in a human way. More importantly, its meaning is enacted, embodied in physical bodies in a down-to-earth setting. Here, body and soul are represented as equals reaching out to each other in gestures of love. This feeling of body and soul as equals interacting harmoniously is not easily achieved. It has happened only after many detours and regressions. And going through this change, he will be able to relate more consciously and creatively to his wife or lover, but only if he never projects the lost part of himself onto someone else. If that is done, he remains forever incomplete, forlorn. In the alchemical pictures, the splendor solace, the sun illumination was late in the pictorial sequence. The thought is that in order to experience the full splendor of this kind of illumination, one must have built a walled garden or sacred space in the psyche to receive the light. The star and the moon pictured a period of deep depression. Here the sun heralds a re-arising into the light. The memories and energies that were gathered in by the moon, the droplets fell upwards, are released now to revitalize the earth. Unlike the kneeling priests, the two children do not depend on faith or the testimony of others to believe in the creator's existence. They experience the, the illumination of the Godhead directly. Illumination is a key factor in this bottom row. So this is the, the bottom row that's being referred to. First, Lucifer, the fallen star, appeared as a devil. Devil. After this, we had the lightning and the tower, and then we had the stars, and then the moon uh, revealed their unique light. This is the point when the hero leaves forever the world of formal dogma and sterile options and steps into the stunning world of direct 
existence or direct experience. Um, and that's today's, if I can get this to stop the share, there we go. So it's all yours, Craig. Yeah, well, thank you, Gary. That's uh, great. And I, Aline and Kevin and Tim, Susan, Azine and Charles, and uh, uh, I think someone else came in. I, well, I, yeah, well, if I miss somebody, just tell me. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, th thank you, Gary. You know, we were talking about uh, earlier about uh, active imagination and meditatio and and where which is uh, internal dialogue with someone uh, uh, with a daemon or someone within us. And uh, where von Franz was talking about the inferior function, the only way you can use the inferior function is through is through play. You can't do anything with it to actually uh, to uh, assimilate it. It can only be done through play. It can't really be done too much through work. I mean, if you really want it to uh, be the open door, the unlocked door to the uh, unconscious. But uh, we're going to talk about those figures uh, that we really should talk to probably more than anyone else is uh, uh, the anima and the animus. And uh, uh, because they are our most, they are the bridge uh, over the inferior function and to the unconscious, uh, to the to the inner world, uh, the the shadow is uh, a little more uh, hard to find, but uh, it is uh, really more has to do. The shadow is cast by the light of the ego, so it's more personal where the anima and the animus are not you and they're alive and they have their consciousness is not you. But we're going to talk about, uh, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the anima and the animus. And uh, just want to mention that everything we're going to talk about is uh, in motion and it is uh, real. Now, if you look right down here, I can't get it too much bigger, but the 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 uh, the solid line is the non-receptive line, and uh, where you get six of those in the I Ching, that's called heaven. That's some place that has no fixed qualities, <laughs> and then the one that has is open on all six lines is the receptive, and that's the earth. That's feminine energy. And then the other one is masculine energy. And we both possess it. And as you uh, both man and woman possess it, and then it comes into play. And it plays and plays into 64 different hexagrams with each one having up to six moving lines. And it moves through the dark and the light. You know, like this. And so when we're talking about this, it's really uh, we're, what we're talking about is going to be, um, you know, in, in in what Jung uh, talked about the uh, about the Kundalini. He says in most psychologies, what we're, our our goal is is to um, to adapt to Muladhara, to the world where where no gods have awoken. And and this there's no uh, no the kundalini serpent is not awoken. That's the goal of most psychologies. Adapt to muladhara, and then some little boy comes and says, um, "There's something behind this door, or there's something under this bed." And then uh, Freud and Adler Young said would say, um, "Say that no, there's nothing behind that door. Don't look." behind that door and uh, uh it's all here in muladhara everything it's just things in muladhara that you've forgotten and this door is outside muladhara and uh uh 
Young says, there is something behind that door. There are such powers. And so that means that the Kundalini serpent has awoken. And it's going to really awake probably most personally in us through the animus and the anima. And uh, you'll find that, that there's a, very, a lot of progressive stages in the animus and the anima but um they're all important don't say well that one's archaic we don't need to consider that one well you're going to meet it you know and at some point in your life but um and, and the whole thing that we're you do is systole and diastole you'll go up to the highest superpersonal animus and then you'll come down to meet loki or some lower animus figure uh, the son of the lower mother. But don't be discouraged. You know, this is from Goethe. For, formation, transformation. Eternal minds in eternal, is uh, in eternal recreation. This is, this is how, um, this is how we become conscious. And what moves that I Ching, really, is, uh, what, what's the, what's the moving energy of the I Ching? You know, it's longing. Longing creates the world. Uh, uh, the the basis of the world is non-being. You know, the darkness of uh, of mere being. And here we're the candle that lights it up. Because in the beginning of the world is desire, longing, and only an absolute vacuum can have longing. A vacuum, uh, non-being, can by longing draw or attract something into itself something exceedingly positive because it creates the world. Now, the world was created in Miladara, but that's the first creation. And so what we're, we're, we're going to be about here is the second creation. What we're going to try to do is to awaken uh, the gods in us, you know, our inner drama, you know, and through it, uh, uh, through a process that goes like this, that undulates, systole and diastole. You know, I embrace it, and then I go in. I embrace it, and then I go in. And through that, you you know, this is that spiral, spiral growth that we're going to exist. So er everything we go through, and we're going to start with the unconscious aspect of the animus, the, how it's met in the unconscious. But then uh, we'll go to the to the more uh, how it manifests in the conscious side. But the animus is really uh, is um, is an ambassador or a representative or master of any sort of knowledge or mental capacities. And it's it has no fixed qualities. It's not uh, earthed. The anima, however, is characterized uh, that all of her forms are at the same time a form of relationship, of relatedness, of eros. And she is, that that is a definitely a fixed quality that is close to the earth. It, it, it is, uh, the idea of it being close to the earth is it's close to nature, it's close to the body, it's near at hand, it's immediate, it's not abstract. In any way, it is I thou, where what the animus tends to be more than often than not is I it. And so then in that aspect, it can be very deceiving. You know, Jung says spirit is very, is very clever and very uh, 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 fascinating, but it tends to be uh, a deceiver, you know, because it needs to be in service to relatedness, to the feeling function, and to eros, and to the immediate and the near at hand, you know, as long as we're alive. And I really don't know what, uh, you, you, you know, uh, what this particular experiment that we are uh, experiencing right now, uh, how it has anything not to do with this um, horse that we ride, our body you know, and that we occupy this surface awareness that's in this uh, marvelous biological form. 
that we that we so undervalue, you know. But anyway, uh, the uh, the idea of the animus is it's the factual orientation of man uh, that's characteristic of the logos principle in its higher forms, and it come it's, it's somewhat objective, you know. It is um, uh, it usually appears as a stranger, something that is uh, unfamiliar to uh, the feminine mind because it stands for what's the strange and unknown and yet it is familiar in some uh, odd way you know and it's um it it can assume different uh forms is is quality of a spirit it's very mobile and it can traverse great distances in a short time uh, this because is because it um it is expressive of the quality of thought which is uh, uh sh and it shares this mobility and e ability to move quickly uh with light now uh, this is so interesting because it comes up all the time in our own uh uh dreams and uh, active imaginations and and you know experience images that we get from the that it that wi wishing and thinking are very closely related wishing is the magical symbolic type of thinking it is it is a it is related to the magical symbolic psychic world and uh, that was uh, wotan whose name was aski which is, means wish and his his attendants were the valkyries were wish maidens and uh what did he become the master of this uh thing of that's the master of 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 uh any sort of ability of knowledge he's the master of the runes he's also an air god you know and uh he, he, he he's related to the turning of the mind the wheel of the mind and his uh uh now, um, the, his transmutability, his ability to assume any form and speed uh, uh, are usually found in fairy tales as attributes of gods or magicians. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the ones that we're, we're going to talk about really are Loki, the flaming one, Mercury with his winged heels. Uh, they have this uh, living, moving, immaterial immaterial no material mater is feminine uh without fixed qualities it is and it's only a dynamism no fixed qualities only a dynamism e expressing the possibility of form or spirit this sort of is a, a a little different take on what uh what this masculine energy is you know uh because it's uh nothing we're talking about here is represents really this strength and power that you usually see this this is we're talking about the animus here not the not uh hercules or something you know uh the animus appears chiefly in the figure of a real man but uh it really any any man distinguished by mental capacities or other masculine qualities he can be, be benevolent or he can be ruthless and cruel you know and often uh it, you, you know the one other thing i would say that everything we're doing here in active imagination dreams and everything is to try to become conscious because every time we're encountering the anima or an animus it's normally we're possessed by it and we're doing it so we're actually experience it it unconsciously we're not conscious of it we're not prometheus standing by there and seeing the fire and assuming his human con uh, he is not going to uh, give up his human stance i am conscious i am not going back into this uh uh uh, uh you know uh participation mystique anymore i will from now on be conscious you know I mean, that's the goal of all of us. And then with that uh, stance, then to awaken, 
the inner uh, psyche. See, I think a lot of times these deities are awaken us, but we're but they possess us. We're not uh, we're not uh, having a dialogue with them that uh, creates makes that the those sixty four hexagrams form in our consciousness and move with the white and the black, and the dark and the light. You know, I mean, that's that's the whole idea of this formation transformation is that it can only be done if we're conscious. So um, now it often is uh, that's the problem when we're unconscious. It's a pseudo hero in us who fascinates by its intellectual brilliance and moral irresponsibility. Uh, and uh, so it's it's again this trickster type of animus. And this it's going to be so important that we differentiate uh, the feminine consciousness within us from the animus, because it's often, uh, you, you know, I sent that little book about by, it's not little, it's uh, almost 1200 pages or 600 pages by uh, Barbara Hanna. And she says, you know, she met Young first in the 1920s. And he said, she said that he had a, uh, almost a virulent allergy to the animus in women uh, because most of them who came to him started it wasn't them speaking it was their animus speaking and Barbara Hanna said I learned very quickly that I was to become conscious of my animus when it spoke and so that I would differentiate between my animus and my feminine side so then I could speak to young, uh, not through the intermediary of the animus that I was unconscious of in me, you know. And uh, this is this is a, a, a real problem. For some reason, young, she said, had a real ear for it. And she says now that he's gone, this book was written in the 70s. She says it's uh, uh, now we have to do it ourselves. He seemed to be doing it all by himself, you know. But uh, anyway, it's that idea of consciousness and that otherwise it's a pseudo hero, you know. So um, now, uh, you know, the animus often, and we heard this from Von Franz, appears in, 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 in a collective group. Now, it can do that because uh, the, the anima can't really do that because she always represents relationship, you know, uh, in all of her forms. She is a form of relationship. But the animus, since he's objective with no fixed qualities and represents something like a, a general knowledge, can also often appear as, uh, as a group of men, a council. Uh, and it, it, the councils represent uh, generally accepted values, which are all, always have a grain of truth in it, but never address the situation at hand in in the feminine uh, uh life you know if she brings in her or if the or her partner starts bringing in generally accepted rules when she's having uh some issue or some she's dealing with someone who has some issue that's that is not that's animus that's not a uh, uh relationship She's treating that person as a high it with this generally accepted rule. There's nothing of I thou receptive about it. Uh, this is, again, uh, at the end of this little 20-page uh, thing, she's going to mention this, uh, where it's sort of flipped now. All these women that, that Anima Young was dealing with now uh, uh, are now in need of feminine... <laughs> consciousness and and in need of nature and the earth because they've they become such disciplined scholars that they, they their feminine qualities have been undervalued and are no longer uh, uh because they are so much valuing the uh their scholarly life um it, and it uh so the uh we'll, we'll we we discussed the dream of the uh of the uh bird-headed man with a whose body could assume any shape uh 
uh, and uh, uh, it um, and it would um, it represented uh, a person uh, whom she had projected her animus image on, who she had just broken up with, and uh, it, it she had heard that it had devoured her boyfriend or her her uh, partner, and it would devour her too. And if you are devoured, you weren't killed outright, but you had to continue living in the monster alive. And uh, of course, this is possession. You know, that's what being unconscious and having some other uh, factor uh, make the decisions for you. Uh, and you're just, uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, you know, Cat keeps having these recurring dreams about zombies. Well, that's pretty much possession, animus possession, you know. But she had a dream recently where she stops and she walks with the with the zombie and talks with him, and uh, as she does, he gradually becomes more human, you know, because she's curing him through through love and relationship. She's uh, it, it's really it was a great dream. So now uh, there the, at the same time she had this bird dream. She had the dream of, of a being consisting only of flame that's in perpetual motion. This is so uh, uh, something very important about the animus. And he called himself the son of the lower mother. And uh, uh, now the son of the lower mother is contrast to the heavenly light mother, mother and it embodies a, a more primordial, dark, earthbound, uh, mother and it's it's uh, uh, child uh, is versed in magic and it's now uh, helpful now witch like or uncanny and often destructive but it also is real and it's an energy in us so her son was some kind of a chthonic because she's the lower earthbound mother fire spirit and uh, uh, the two that she brings up now these are animus figures uh just like uh and and they are not archaic they're uh elemental in us uh, let me see uh is uh um loki okay so he's a fire spirit you know you can see his his uh you know he his fire uh, is red hair it's just uh like a fire and uh now he is sort of uh, uh, an undirected uh, force of nature, Loki, you know, but he is uh, a very important uh, masculine fig figure uh, to the feminine and w w can possibly be uh, encountered. Now he he's in contrast to um, Hephaestus, who is a, uh, uh, also a fire god, but he uh, is is the god of forges. So I mean, he his fire is more of a controlled fire, you know. So uh, this is this is the aspect of animus as fire and and prime motion, uh, perpetual motion. Uh, but both of of Loki and Hephaestus are also the gods of design and creativity. Uh, you you know basically in in we learn in in uh, the Kundalini that once you've entered uh, the third chakra, which is the fire chakra, uh, you can never go back because you've been you there's been a flame lit in you, okay, and now that once that flame has been kindled in you, you can never go back to Muladhara. So when we see Loki or Hephaestus, that's a, as a awakened uh, uh, serpent or Kundalini in us, that means that uh, the, the fire has been kindled in us. Now this fire, this longing, really, the longing and the fire are the same thing, is going to kindle or be the heat from now on. It's going to be what from now on is going to... Uh, uh, be the heat of the process of transformation, you know. So that is a very important 
figure in dreams, this fire spirit. And um, now uh, it is, uh, he expresses himself positively in this being the God of design and creativity, and uh, particularly in the handling of material and its artistic treatment. Um, but he can express himself negatively, the fire, uh, uh, in states of tension or explosive effect, affect, you know, emotional display uh, in, in sometimes uh, very calamitous ways. And but he is a confederate to the more. So he is the son of the lower mother in us. OK, so this is this is the this is a confederate of the primordial feminine in you, you know, and it's her son. And yet he's very important. He kindles the fire in us, you know. Do you think that the high white, <laughs> highest white albedo uh, deity is going to kindle a fire in you? He's not very fiery. You know, he's he's a, a, a lot different. So we need this this aspect in us. Uh, the, the son of the lower mo mother, the fire uh, that's going to kindle uh, 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 set the fire on in us and it will never leave us uh you know a fiery woman you know this is one who is uh uh you you know is hopefully if she's if she's fiery like buddhika you know or some uh uh you know uh aspect that is not she does it consciously that means she she's possesses the power of loki if she's possessed by loki then that's demonic you know so um any uh, let's see now this is in contrast to the higher this there's also uh these other gods now now the god other higher gods are going to be air gods they're not going to be fire gods uh uh so and that would be um both wotan and hermes and they are definitely not uh sons of the lower mother you know, I mean, there's uh, uh, Hermes is usually he is called the guide of souls, you know, I mean, here he's guiding all these women here, you know, uh, he's the guide of souls, but he has he has wings on his feet. And uh, uh, and then uh, Wotan is, uh, you know, his his winged beings are. Um, are the ravens you know but uh he's uh you, you know he's he's a different kind of air god but he is called the lord of spirits too you know uh and uh so he's he's sort of the lord of the air uh you know young uh when he first moved into bollingen this was in 1924 it was right after his mother died uh you know um he uh was staying there all by himself and he uh uh it, at one night uh he heard footsteps around the tower and the sound of voices singing and music which seemed to come closer and uh uh he had this uh uh you, you know uh heard voices footsteps and singing and he uh woke up uh it, and he, after he awoke he still heard it and there was and then he had this image of several hundred dark clad figures uh marching around uh Bollingen but when he went to the window uh there was nothing and he just said it thought it was must be something ghostly but then um he he came across someone who lived very nearby uh in the 17th century um it, it, you know, heard this procession uh, late at night with men talking, singing, and making music. And it was said that was uh, Wotan practiced his magic arts there. And it was Wotan's army of souls uh, who were in the habit of walking abroad and showing themselves. You know, it was funny that when when uh, when Young first went to uh, Bollinger and bought the property, his you know you know he's got uh all this price work blood in him 
you know, and uh, his, uh, who were, uh, you know, mediums. And his daughter, Greta, says, looks around, and says, she says, there's spooks about, <laughs> you know. And, and while they were digging the foundation, they found uh, uh, graves under, <laughs> underneath <laughs> the thing. And, and then uh, Von Franz said, that when people slept there, they often had dreams of uh, people in military uniforms. And they found out later that this was a uh, cemetery for, uh, for I think the Huguenot army or something. Uh, they, when they, in this battle of, uh, to make uh, Switzerland independent. But anyway, um, that's, uh, they, they, uh, you know, you have, you, you've got, uh, so you now you've got uh, Loki and Hephaestus, and then you've got Wotan and Hermes that also represent volatile aspects of one of the air and the other of fire. And uh, so these, these come up there, they are energies in us. Now, then she has this dream here, uh, this same woman. It's very interesting. Uh, it was a snake or dragon-like creature who's together with her and she's under his power. And the dragon had the ability to stretch in any direction. So there was no possibility for this girl to evade his reach. At any moment, uh, any, any movement of hers, he could extend himself beyond her and made, so he made escape impossible. This is his uh, changeability and his uh, ability to transform. And also it is, it is the general process of the feminine mind encountering this strange masculine uh, aspect, which seems to be very powerful. And the question is, is she going to be consciously feminine and have it be in relationship with her? Or is she going to be uh, possessed by it? Is she gonna be devoured? by the bird monster or is she going to be and this one here is is keeping her prisoner this magician dragon you know and uh uh so uh that that is it comes up very often the girl here is her soul i think that's so interesting too that the soul in man is a woman the soul in woman's dreams is also feminine you know and uh, so the shadow in man is, is masculine, but the shadow in feminine dreams is, uh, uh, is usually, uh, I mean, the uh, animus in, in feminine dreams is going to be complementary to whatever uh, her, her attitude if, is. If it's feminine, it's going to be male, you know? And uh, so her shadow can be either her soul or her shadow. You know, but it'll be feminine. You know, it's just an interesting uh, way to keep in mind when we're we're hearing each other's dreams. You know, uh, that the the reason the soul is always feminine is because she always represents the life force, and it can't be masculine, and it needs to be uh, uh, related to the body. You know, uh, because spirit is not related to the body. You know, uh, sorry. You know, yeah. Craig, that's confusing. Can okay, you sure. repeat that? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying this. Uh, soul is related to the body. She has a material quality. And so she will always be feminine, both in men and women. You know, and she because she represents the life force and because she represents nature. So she's yes. she, her what she really is the personification of is nature the life force and uh transformation you know but, but the what the, the animus the, sh the animus. shadow can also be oh, feminine yeah okay yeah would shadow, be feminine in a woman yeah yeah so she can so you have to be very careful you know i i i'm uh i'm a, kind of out of my pay grade here but but i'm just saying that I, this is just uh that line that Emma Young had here sort of was a revelation to me because she says uh, this uh, girl here is the soul, you know, the girl that's being uh, 
uh, now, if this was a man who was being possessed by that dragon, that would not be his soul that was possessed by. Go ahead, Tim. Did you have something? Or no? Okay, I, I thought you were going to say something. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, it's just sort of interesting that the, the girl is the soul here. So now it's a, this is a constant. But the shadow would of a uh, feminine someone who identifies as feminine would always be feminine, and yes. for the man always masculine, right? Yeah, the, right. The shadow is going to be uh, is going to be very closely related to the ego because it's cast by the light of the ego. So it's going to be those dark aspects of the ego, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the darker aspects of the ego. So it's going to tend to be our, uh, uh, you, you know, those aspects of us, which, um, you know, are compulsive, that we do things without uh, thinking, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you, you know, it's, it's interesting in my wife's dreams, though, she, she as the dream ego is the shadow her new self or her soul is the daughter her own daughter you know and she's the one who's who's sort of uh you know uh uh is is telling her in her you know she was had had an a, a addiction and she has dreams about being in in the addiction again and then the daughter comes to her and says you shouldn't be doing that. Where she, in her conscious life, would never do that any, anymore. But she, you know, it tends to be called you know drinking dreams is is what they call it in AA. But anyway, it's it's just sort of a be, when she said that the girl is the soul. If this was a man who had that dream, it wouldn't be his soul, you know. And I just thought it was an interesting. It was just something that occurred to me. You know, I'm 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 glad to hear. Anyone who can uh, give more nuance to that, you know, well, um, but here she was very, this, her soul is very shadowy and with blurred outlines. Uh, and uh, uh, then, then we heard, we listened to this dream last time, but it was, it, it is, a, it's the same dream as this one about the dragon where this girl is, uh, is supposed to dance before a king uh, he works for a she works for a magician. She's supposed to do a dance of transformation, and uh, where she throws one veil off after another, you know, uh, you know, keeps revealing uh, new things. And so, it, through doing this, she impersonates uh, a, a motley succession of figures, both animals and men. This tran dance of transformation. Uh, and she is doing it because she's hypnotized by the magician. But then a mysterious influence is exerted upon her by the king, who's superior to the magician. And uh, she goes more and more into ecstasy. And now she disregards the magician. And she uh, now uh, she dances and she's not. And the magician orders her to stop. She doesn't stop. And then she throws, uh, in her last uh, movement, she throws her body off as the last fail. And she falls to the earth as a skeleton. Uh, and then she's buried and out of the grave, a flower grows and it's a white woman now. The, and it becomes a white woman. So this is the same dream as the dragon, but here, uh, the young girl who's in possession of the dragon, magician this time, uh, the, whose commands must be obeyed without choice, but through the uh, intercession uh, of the king, magician, uh, the king, the magician has an opponent, and the king sets a limit to the dragon or the magician's power over her. So this is the positive uh, animus coming through. And he brings it about that she no longer dances at the command of the animus, but of her own volition. Okay, so she's become consciously feminine, as Marion Woodman would say. And the transformation, uh, uh, which was previously uh, only indicated, now is reality. There's real transformation. And uh, uh, what comes, what, what, what happens 
after she becomes consciously feminine, a new being arises from the earth. Okay. And now it's in a changed and a purified form. The fact that it is white means that it has now its ally is, is the king, you know, the animus. And so this doubling of the figure is very important. Uh, the uh, In the magician, the lower form uh, of uh, it, this magic power of, of the uh, magician uh, makes the girl take on uh, transforming forms, but they're fake. They're not real. While the king embodies a higher principle. And so now this, this is not a fake transformation. It's a real one. So this is the important function of the higher animus is that of uh, it initiates and accompanies, because she's white, a white woman, the soul's transformation. Uh, it, 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 the, it's, uh, uh, this, this comes up, she has one, here's the next dream. I'll just go into the next dream. Um, that the girl, this is this is a little. Um, uh, this dream was somewhat lighter. This one is a little darker. The girl has a ghostly li lover, who lives in the moon, and he comes regularly to receive a, a blood sacrifice, which she must make to him. And uh, she lives in freedom among the people when he's not around. But at the approach of the new moon, she turns it is is uh, you know possessed by him, turns into a rapacious beast, and uh, obeying an ir irresistible force, she has to climb to a lonely height, uh, make an ascent, and bring her lover the sacrifice. But like in Cat's dream, where she talks to the zombie, as she brings him these uh, sacrifices, uh, now this this is very so interesting, that, that he himself, this um, ghostly lover who lives in the moon, uh, becomes a sacrificial vessel, vessel, a, sa a vessel of sacrifice, uh, which, so he's become a vessel of sacrifice through her sacrifices. And uh, so the smoking blood that of the sacrifice then turns into a plant-like form, a more feminine form, out of which spring uh, many colored flowers. So <laughs> this is another... Uh, dream of the of the uh, of the animus acting first as uh something that possesses her and then is is a is a uh, vehicle of transformation and and the idea i think here is is how does the feminine relate to this very powerful volatile or someone who's close to nature incorporate and assimilate these powers of, of of these volatile powers uh in her and not be possessed by them because they are so powerful you know and uh, it, it, when they're mixed with nature you know uh they they tend to overwhelm nature and they cannot overwhelm nature and so by the blood received by the psychic energy given to it the spiritual principle loses its dangerously compulsive and destructive character. And then the woman can now receive an independent life and activity of her own. And, and this actually happens in Bluebeard. Uh, you know, the, the one whose uh, name is Amandus, he who must be loved, it's his name. You know, he, he lures the girl into his house, gives her wine to drink, and uh, then afterwards is is going to basically um, he is going to kill her. But you you'll find that the uh, the ones who are killed in Bluebeard's uh, chamber always can be brought back to life. You know, so they're really in a sense state of suspended animation. Even if he cuts their heads off, you know, uh, they can be rescued and and taken out. So that so what he's really doing is killing the feminine is sort of like a sleeping beauty story if you really uh listen to it uh and, and not make it too literal <laughs> so uh now it so he is going to he gets the girl intoxicated 
and is about ready to do the same thing to her. But she embraces him. Now, what does she, how, how does she defang him? She embraces him and he is immediately robbed of his power and dissolves into the air. And, uh, but first promising to stand by her side as a helpful spirit. So the idea of how does the feminine consciousness uh, make this zombie-like quality human, it's through relationship. That's the, what she, through relationship, she can make this, this somewhat compulsive, destructive powers uh, be, uh, uh, in, she can have a collaboration with them. And uh, that this collaboration is very, very important because of uh, um, it awakens the psyche. I mean, actually, what will happen is you know we, you go from muladhara to the to the water chakra, uh, and then you go to the fire chakra, then you go to the air chakra, which is the heart. You know, it's, which is interesting about the heart is. That, surrounded by the lungs you know so the heart and the lungs have a sort of a strange relationship the heart and and the spirit the air so um uh that that is uh, so these visions are indications of important archetypal form of the animus which appears in dreams now it also appears in, in the cult of Dionysus, and maybe we can end here, but I am going, a, I'm going to go a little slower through this because even though I can't wait to get to the next part, because it's also important, you know, uh, Dionysus, uh, I, I think it's important in this sense, is that, um, is in fact, you, you know, be it'd be almost better if we did this and then reviewed it again, because the idea is, here is is like like uh, Emma Young says that a, a, as we go through these images over and over again, these figures become familiar to us, just like people that we walk down the street every the same street every day become familiar to us, and then then uh, we we they are differentiated. Well, Dionysus is a very interesting uh, animus figure. Uh, he, unlike all the other Greek gods. Um, his attendants are not the same sex as he. Uh, they are maenads, you know, uh, uh, and uh, they're very uh, interesting because uh, let me just first show you Dionysus uh, here. I just love this. This is from Nietzsche. You know, Ariadne uh, discovers her lover Theseus has disappeared in the night, leaving her on the island of Naxos all alone. And then the god Dionysus appears, takes her by the ear, and he whispers, Thou hast small ears, but thou hast my ears. Put a cunning word in. I am thy labyrinth. Now, this is a very interesting uh, deity who has this relationship with the feminine. Now, his his um, uh, attendees are the maenads, and uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, unlike uh, the cults of Mount Olympus, uh, they always uh, only dance at, at uh, night under the moon. And these maenads are all these ecstatic feminine figures who, uh, who uh, you know, um, kill uh, what what they really do is they seem to consume the life force you know they're supposedly are hunting women you know they hunt down uh uh, uh animals and uh really basically you know they say they tear them to shreds but you know that that the, that's very literal what they're really doing is something with the life force now later um, we're going to hear about osiris now, see, Osiris, like the Pied Piper of Hamlin, you know, has this uh, ability through music to um, uh, take us to worlds 
uh, that are, uh, you, you know, take us to all kinds of worlds. Well, he was killed by the Maenads too, uh, Osiris, which is uh, very interesting, you know, and then he became this singing head, you know, but uh, Osiris was a, uh, um, we're going to hear this in, um, like I say, uh, Diana would love to jump to the part about music again, but um, the, the, uh, uh, the blood offering to the moon spirit took place at night on a mountaintop. Now, it's interesting here. Oh, well, let me just finish with it, this because it really is part of the music part. Uh, that Now, she's saying this Dionysian cult of, of, of uh, uh, where these women become very compulsive uh, under the influence of Dionysus at night is very reminiscent of the Pied Piper or the rat catcher of Hamlin, or a waterman or some elfin king in folk songs who all employ music to lure maidens to their water or forest kingdoms. Uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they lure them uh, with this music that makes these uh, women or children, or anyone really, uh, you know, in the case of, of uh, Orpheus, I meant Orpheus, if I, I think I said Osiris, and they were obliged to follow him, not only rats, but the children of the city, which refused uh, to reward uh, the Pied Piper's services. So he drew them after him and made them disappear in the mountain. And uh, Orpheus uh, used such a magic flute, uh, lyre, uh, magic music from his lyre that men and beasts were forced to follow him. This feeling of being irresistibly lured. Now, this is that longing aspect. Irresistibly lured and led away into unknown distances. This is into the unconscious, really, of waters, forests, mountains, or into the underworld. Now, this is typical uh, animus phenomenon, but it's sort of difficult to explain because it's contrary to their more intellectual activities uh, which don't bring us to consciousness but bring us to the unconscious but maybe this is really uh where we're supposed to go uh and uh, i think i you know the, the the protocols are going to come out very soon uh which are uh you know the the outtakes from memories dreams and reflections and, and one of them is this uh uh when when young uh uh, you know, hesitated to pursue a deepening bond with Tony Wolf. Uh, there was a period of no contact with them. He would basically discharge her from analysis. And Young says uh, in the protocols that that was one year that they were separated. Eventually, however, he felt that he simply had to reestablish contact with her, not only because he could not forget her, but because he began to experience a series of bizarre occurrences that he believed were clear indications from his unconscious that a relationship with her was destined to be. One such edict came in the form of a dream, a nightmare, in which uh, uh, he dreamt that he almost lost her. It, it occurred about a year after their analysis. He dreamt that he and Tony were walking in the Swiss Alps, scrambling over boulders, when suddenly a band of elves appeared and began to sing, attempting to lure Tony into their mountain grotto. And Young knew that if he allowed her to follow these their siren call, their irresistible uh, fascination, he would lose her forever. And in the dream, he thought to himself, this must not happen. This was in the dream. And so just as he was about, just as she was about to vanish into their mountain, he pulled her back. And after this dream, this was in the dream, he pulled her back. Young, conf Young confessed after the dream. He uh, contacted her by letter because I knew it was in inevitable. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're going, and, and we're going to learn uh, so much about uh, how music is uh, definitely spirit, definitely animus, 
it is wordless and it uh it, it, it and where it does and wh what its purpose is is to take us to unknown realms places that are nowhere and that we've never been before and yet we must experience and this um music and dance uh emma young says are the probably she thinks uh, one of the most profound expressions of spirit in the feminine mind now this is going to be in great contrast to uh you know uh, masculine's highest valued spiritual uh, what what the men, men most value as as spiritual which tends to be i don't know what you know maybe we can discuss that. oh well anyway gary why don't you take over and we'll just uh, go around the room and Sorry, I took so long, but I am going to take a while on this that, one. Uh, yeah, that last image. Um, so, why did I mean? You know, in this dream, he knew to interpret Tony, you know, somewhat literally as actually Tony Wolf, and not as a part of himself that represented that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when would you make that distinction? Do you think? Well, he he had other images of her. Uh, uh, one. Um, uh, I mean, I think that uh, one of them was uh, there. There was other occurrences, and I can't remember them right now, uh, that were uh, related to his separation from Tony Wall. Oh, so this was part of a series. He, of yes, sense. part of a series, and uh, he tended to pay attention to these messages, you know, and so, the fact yeah. that he pulls her back in the dream pulls Tony Wolf back. What else could that mean but that he needed to pull her back in his life? Well, I, thought, I had the same question. I kind of think if, if I had that dream or if I was interpreting that dream, you know, that powerful extra marital female mm -hmm. figure would always be the muse or, or would be the the anima would it not right and, yes in myself so, i yeah, i've had that same dream and so why in the world would he suddenly decide oh this is not me this is this is the real literal person yeah that that's a question now i i think uh i i will send that book uh by nan healy you know which is about the collaboration with tony wall and let's read a little bit more about that read what follows that you know, or or precedes it. But, uh, you know, I had a, a girl who I was very, very, uh, uh, you know, um, smitten with, and she left me, you know, and she didn't, uh, you know, of course, I'm now it's unrequited love, you know, I don't, she's not returning my love. And I had a dream that uh, I don't have, I still have dreams. And this was 35 years ago. Uh, that she was in a bubble and I was not to touch her. So <laughs> it was exactly <laughs> the opposite of this one. Mm. Don't touch this girl. Don't go there. Yeah. Zen, would you like to go next? Yes, please. Um, so about the literal and the, the literal interpretation, uh, we tend here to say that it's not literal. We have to have a symbolic interpretation of things. But um, the fact is um, the dream interpretation is both. Mm -hmm. So it can be Tony Wolf at some level and it can be Anima at another level. There's no contradiction. And with dreams, most of the times you, you can have a uh, prediction things that really, really will happen or really, really have happened. But um, there's also a symbolic um, interpretation of that. And I also want to say something about this whole energy of anima and animals. I've written a book, um, it's 120 pages right now. And the reason I wrote this book, or I'm writing this book is that um, there's, um, few books on anima and animals, and most of them are really complicated. And it's hard for people to understand. I know that in my students, uh, for my students, it was always a, a hard to grasp um, concept. 
So I try to make it really, really simple. And uh, I put all these levels of integration with anima and animus into tables. You can compare them, you can see them. So um, it's really, really simplified um, without losing the content. So with anima and animus, what I think is that, you know that libido was very sexual with, um, for Freud. And for Jung, libido was more uh, diverse in manifestation. But the truth is when the libido comes um, from the depth of psychoid and it enters the collective unconscious, personal unconscious, and then goes through the ego and manifests um, as behavior, thoughts, and feelings, um, libido, the first manifestation or the first channel that libido comes through is animal one. So it's very much sexual. Um, the important thing here is that anima and animus are archetypes. They are not energies. When we are talking about energies, this female, f- feminine or masculine energy, we're talking about principles, the forces, the energies is na- in nature. But anima and animus are as many as all other archetypes, there are patterns, there are forms, there are channels that libido passes through them and takes the form. So I remember last time, I think it was um, Kevin that said that all archetypes are kind of driven from the anima and animus. They're not because I, each archetype has its own form. But what is um, probably what uh, he's trying to say is that the energy, the libido that comes through these channels of animal animus then enters other archetypes. So if you're talking about the warrior archetype, it's different between uh, for men and women. In general, um, we can say that Consciousness is masculine and unconscious is watery, it's feminine. But the truth is in um, female form, which are women, we call women female form and um, men as male form. Uh, For us, for women, the whole psychic energy for us is male. It's, um, it's com- it, the main source is animus because it's, um, if you see it as like an onion, it's female form, inside it is animus and inside the animus is animal. Then it goes animus, animal. It's like two mirrors, like reflecting for an eternal reflection. So um, the first layer, when I go to my psyche as a woman, It's animus. And um, the manifestation of each archetype is different between men, uh, in men and women. So I think um, uh, there is a general understanding, like we said, generally soul is feminine and um, the spirit is uh, masculine or related to animus. But in both genders, there's verification. And we should not forget that these are not extremes. They are not, it's a range. So all of us, even gods, even gods experience this range of uh, um, feminine and masculine. For example, Dionysus or Apollo, they are very much feminine. Uh, They have a lot of feminine energy in them. Unlike Zeus or for example, the, the three brothers. So anyways, I think um, it's important to um, have this um, like a picture, the picture of what is happening in the psyche. And then we can deal with the complexities, like what happens when you, when a woman is discovering the animal, right? Like, like right now in my life, I'm in the, I'm exactly in that state of rediscovering femininity that we talked about last time, Craig. So it's really interesting. It can be very hard to understand if you don't have this image, this structure of 
um, how things are working. Thank you. That's very, that's really, I can't wait to read your book. Thank you. Yeah, you'll have to, you'll have to, you know, give us a small presentation on it. That'd be interesting. Oh my God, I have so many things to do. I have to make copies of myself. But um, 2023 will be all. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, John, would you like to go next? Uh, thanks. This has just always been confusing for me, so I'll just listen. But uh, I love that painting you showed of Waterhouse and where uh, Nim's finding the head of Orpheus. That's a uh, He's one of my favorite artists, so um, I think, but I think in that dream of Tony Wolf, I think it does represent both, you know, on an archetypal level and a personal level. I think as so many things in our dreams do. Thanks. Yeah, you, you know, there was one uh, woman who was dreaming about her uh, dead husband and and I think she had 24 dreams and, and Von Franz told her that 12 of them, that was really him in her dream and the other uh were uh you, you know more uh, an animus figure and just to check it she brought him to young and didn't say anything about this woman's situation and young told her oh there's 12 of those where that is actually a visitation you know <laughs> so i just remember that i was uh, when i was reading young he uh, tells a story about when he was swimming in the uh, lake between his stone castle. Yeah. He had such a great pain in one of his legs. Yes. And then he was thinking about Tony Wolf and he uh, promised that he will take up the relationship mm -hmm. with oh. her. And then the pain went yeah. off and uh, that's what I, <laughs> I will never forget. Yeah. It was a real physical uh, thing in all this kind of uh, theories, yeah. theoretical animus and anima discussion. It's uh, what what uh, could you call it? It's not a dream. It's no, a, no. It's a, it's a compulsion. Uh, you know that that's what young uh, or or I think it was von Franz says that certain dreams. Uh, what like that one guy who has a dream that he should go m talk to this girl and he says uh that's just my projection on her i'll go have an active imagination and poof it'll all be gone i think that's yeah. what that dream wanted me to do and mm -hmm. and yet uh, but he Francis, was swimming he was uh, yeah. really swimming it was yes. no 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 active imagination in that way uh, but could you say it was a, an active imagination in some way because yes. he was thinking and uh, feeling the pain and uh, but uh, extraordinary uh, physical um, experience because the pain disappeared well he made a and promise he could, that he could it, hardly stop yeah. he could hardly uh, get on swimming he was uh, really afraid of that not if he being didn't able make that to promise, continue. Yes, yeah, if, if until he, he made. Yes. If he didn't make the promise, uh, he had to make the promise uh, yes. to be saved. Yes. You know, and that that was what uh, von Franz says. Some of these in dreams are invitations to life. They're not projections. Mm. That the dream yes. is send you an invitation to participate yes. in the world. Which, by the way, the animus. It, anima and animus are bridges not just to the inner world their projections are bridges to the outer world you mm -hmm. know so yes. in other words the fasten the fact that the either the feminine or the masculine form fascinate us and create great longing in us to go and talk to that person or have a relationship with that person is uh is is magic now, some a lot of it is projection, but von Franz says sometimes it's not a projection. Sometimes it's a, it's is the life force is telling you go, go, go. You know. Dan, uh, would you like to go next, Diane? Well, this is becoming 
you know, I'm getting moments of clarity through reading this, and uh, I think it'll uh, lead to to uh, be more become more clear to me as we go forward with this. It is complicated, and but it seems to me like basically at this point, what I'm thinking is that whether be it a, a the anima or the animus, it, it's about a collabor like collaboration with that internal, um, whatever the form the archetype takes. And that way you can move forward in what is needed at that point in your development. So that kind of makes it easier for me to understand you know the difference between because sometimes i wonder well if it's this way for a woman what is it for a man but you know i i think just sticking to that that it's a collaboration it's a relationship it's forming a relationship one way or the other whether it's a man and it's a anima you're forming a relationship that helps you to move forward in your development. And the same thing for women, if it's the animals. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. That's great. Elaine, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, can, I can't pretend to speak on the anima and animus, but I've had a, a real interesting week because uh, we're building a house and I really got to engage with the builders, the framers this week. And um, what a collaboration into life, because this one framer is very flirty with me, you know, I'm almost 80, <laughs> but the fire in this man for the creative, uh, just little touches that I wanted to have in the house, like inset wall, alcove things, kind of a Moroccan theme and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I also wanted to say that uh, talking about longing creating the world. Well, Gurdjieff said that wish is the strongest force in the universe, stronger than God even. And I just love that, you know? And uh, so that's really, that's really all I have is this is a life force is uh, pulling me into my own femininity because of this group, being able to listen to everybody. And um, it's just so enriching for my actual life. And um, I don't have dreams at my age. My whole life is kind of a dream, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Susan? Um, yeah, I don't have much to say. I, I mean, it's just wonderful, wonderful material. And I, um, I can get very possessed by my anima, so it's very helpful. And I, I recently had a dream where there was an animus in this kind of body of water and I needed him to get out and help me. And I think, um, I, and I'm just, I've been thinking about that dream so much. And I, I did some active imagination with it. And um, I, you know, the other um, thing, and Craig, I've learned so much from your teaching and this, the feminine fairy tales just was just phenomenal. I'm just trying to understand animus um, and your, your ability to um, kind of make it understandable. Um, one quote that I wrote down from this, from the current text um, that I really liked was uh, Juan Franz says that the psychological Psychological regression can only be avoided by constant conscious effort. Yes. And I, I think that that is what, you know, just this constant, like um, trying to understand these, you know, um, energies. And thank you, Azine, for talking more about the form. You know, I think that's so helpful too. Um, though I have to think more about that. But um, anyway, thank you. It's really nice to be here. Very good. Uh, the conscious conscious the con continuous conscious effort is is this is if you if it's like uh, you're pumping water and it, it almost gets to the top and they say oh i'm tired and you let it go back down i mean it it, it, it you don't it, it needs con 
they will be the you will offend the gods if you stop and they'll go back down uh kevin would you like to go next yeah i don't really have so much to say i think uh greg said it pretty much uh all of it um mm -hmm. We'll, we'll keep going on it too. I, I just want to spend a little more time on this thing than we did before, you know. So. Uh, Ava, do you have anything more? Yes. The clearing point uh, today was uh, that uh, Animas could be a counseling uh, group. And mm -hmm. I had <laughs> such a dream. And uh, um, I feel for me it's just through my own dreams, as I had said before, mm -hmm. um, that that is connected to uh, the experience of the dream and the feelings and all kind of what uh, um, those figures um, wake up in me. So it, it, it is really um, the water of life, and unless uh we fill ourselves with the dreams mm. we're we're not where is the water of life going to come from elsewhere i mean because the yeah. dreams are are really are are the closest thing we have to our nature that's conscious yeah because it's it's yes. absolutely and we have to go to yes to, uh, excuse me that i interrupted you no. Craig. Yeah. Uh, it, it's um through our own experience, uh, it, because it could be so different. Yes. For different people. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing that you know it's the same voice, but it speaks to that which we are not. You are not, then I am not, and mm. so it's a it's it's really is. A... And it's uh, in the same way it clarify who I am or yes how myself deeper self definitely is constituted thank you uh, Ava Annette hi yes um, yeah beautiful uh, beautiful uh, session again and um, it reminds me of, of what I shared earlier but I have ongoing animus dreams but I I they're very personal, you know, that, and that's more for the dream group. But um, what I shared earlier, yeah, and and I often thought, uh, you know, that painting I shared a long time ago. But but I often um, also thought, like, why is that actually needed a, a lower animus? You know, why why would you have such a archetype in your life actually you know mm -hmm. and then i i felt like what you said indeed with the fire but it also from my own experience it it broke a kind of rigidness in me it it um it broke rigid boundaries basically and uh like as if i needed that kind of uh force you know and um so that's that's all I have to say at the moment, you know. But it's it's ongoing. It's it's ongoing. This this animus uh, dreams. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Annette. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. that, that image of breaking, you know, difficult boundaries. Uh, yes. Dahlia. Yeah. Okay. So I have a few thoughts, and um, I know I I didn't read the book yet the, with mm -hmm. the with all the dreams, but the one you shared about the whole, the ghost of mm -hmm. the moon mm -hmm. and uh, like bloody sacrifices. I know it makes me think about menstrual cycle and if it's related in her psyche. And then mm -hmm. I don't know how does it might be related, but I'll read the book. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, find out. <laughs> but that, yeah, that catches my attention. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe uh, also about the, like about dreams and whether they are literal or not, and how I know I like three or four years ago when I didn't pay attention at all to my dreams. So I did have one like 
kind of predictive one and like very sy symbolic, like I was dreaming about a black big uh, stone and cracking with lava and my mom was laying in the, in the room and I said we should go out. And later I found out like in a month or two, like she had cancer. So everything, it was like made sense and it was very strong. So now when I'm paying attention to dreams, I don't have that kind of intensity and it's, it doesn't move me kind of. So, but then it was like, I don't know, the energy was like, like asking for resolution or, or action or something like that. So, so yeah, that's, that's what, how maybe dream moves me. And also about animus figures. Yes, so I know I, me, for me personally, I, I have a lot different men I'm dreaming about. And it's like, I don't know. And it's, I'm getting very feisty with them in dreams. Like it's very, um, I don't know. Uh, it's very dif different when I was sharing my dreams like a couple months ago and it was very kind of elegant and intelligent. Now it's like very, uh, I don't know. So I'm kind of your ideas like about uh, accepting lower animals, animals or something like it's also, uh, part of work, so it makes sense now for me. So I think that's it. I, I think that we continuously. I mean, we we uh, we you, you know we're never. Uh, I, I mean, there's there's regressions and there's progressions, you know, uh, and uh, and they're part of the process. So I think when we have a lower anima stream or a nightmare or something like that, that's part of the process. You know, you just have to be accepting of it as a gift. You know, me, it's stiff. I love dreams that kick my butt. You know, I mean, I really do. I love to get a hexagram that uh, in the I Ching that kicks my butt. I mean, I, for a second, I, I feel hurt that you were mean to me, but <laughs> I, I, it takes me a while, but I, I get over it. You know, Charles. Um, I don't, I don't have a whole lot. Um, I'm actually out doing deliveries right now, so I'm kind of just listening. Uh, I, I kind of dealing with the same old stuff, just trying to get back into uh, doing inner work. Been in a period of time where I kind of just don't know what I like or what I want or anything. Um, it's kind of why I haven't been here for a while. Um, that wasn't even sure if I wanted to do this anymore. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's what's going on with me. Yeah. Well, I'm very yeah. uh, oh. uh, hopeful for you, Charles. I think you're, I hope I'm very, uh, hope, wish you well on what you're doing right now. For sure. Uh, Tim, did you have, uh, any follow on comments? Well, one thing that, uh, that kind of stuck with me was this idea that once you enter the fire chakra, you can't go back. And it reminds me of a psychological theory that I ran into many years ago by Dabrowski, this Canadian psychologist. I wonder if you guys know about him. Um, he has this theory of, of positive disintegration that kind of follows Maslow's hierarchy in in the moral development of a person. And I, that just had a powerful effect on me. And I haven't heard anything about it since then. And the idea is that as you mature, you have these crises that kind of collapse your structure. But when it gets rebuilt, it doesn't get rebuilt to the, to the old level, unless somehow you are so regressed that you can't ever move forward, like, like Trump can never move forward. But most people, when they have a kind of catastrophe, build on their experience and, and learn to be more widely 
uh, compassionate, I think, in the world. And I'm just curious if other people are familiar with that theory or if there's a if there's some kind of ongoing um, dialogue about that. I think it's, it's just very well expressed in uh, in uh, alchemy through the calcinatio, the mortificatio, uh, the idea of and also in the mortar and pestle of Baba Yaga, you know, I mean, we, we, uh, Kat and, uh, and Ava and I were talking about, I remember Martin Buber says that success is not one of the names of God, you know, in other words, it is only through the, uh, burning down of the house of, of our ego that we're ever going to be to able to rebuild it uh, uh th with a different uh 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 you know to be reborn i guess basically you know i mean that that idea is that it, we need to burn that thing down to the temple of wisdom the rock on which the temple of the wisdom is built and then rebuild it on that rock and that's the purpose of inanna uh giving up all her uh possessions to get to through the seven gates down to the bottom. And I would say too, this is, this is a, just a recent revelation I had that it isn't not only going to the bottom of, of from inflation to depression. It's also, uh, we found that in, uh, in uh, uh, both the living symbol and the vision seminars is to, you need to go back to the most primordial aspect of our biological life. You know where she sees the uh, uh, the eyes of woe and beauty. You know, I mean, it's that that's this aspect of of sort of this creative destruction. Well, I think that's uh, everyone, Craig. Okay. Unless anyone else has something. Well, we'll keep going through this uh, uh, a little bit slower than normal, but I I think every one of these images are something we need to discuss and. Uh, and I'd like to do a little review as we go so that we can get it more into it. Now, what we're looking at right now are the, as the animus as uh, appears in the 1930s in the unconscious of women, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and some of this is through myth, some of it's through dream, you know, but the idea is here's how it appeared. You know, Jung calls himself a, a empiricist, someone who only deals with psychic reality, psychic facts. Well, these are all psychic facts. These are things that pe really happen to people. So that's what they're trying to stay focused on and not so much the theory other than the interpretation of it. But I think after we get through this, uh, uh, you know, sort of grinding through it, we'll be a little bit m better equipped to go through the animus fairy tales, you know, the fairy tales that have animus in it so anyway well thank now i put the new link to there because somebody open that and see if it's okay i checked it it didn't work i you know you you have to make the link available to everyone i think it's set to just one person okay right great now. i'll i'll send it this week yeah i had the same trouble uh, on the new one i sent yeah yeah okay all right i will I'll, and I'll... also i just want to encourage azim to to give us that presentation because yeah Man, that just sounds really exciting. Or just some of the slides. You don't have to give a, a full hour presentation, but just show us some of your 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 notes. Yeah. Tim, you you created a lot of problem for me. Okay. Suggestion, suggestion uh, the center consciousness um, yes. presentation. I'm okay. doing the whole book and a whole uh, course. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Never, well, just give us some sneak peeks. Does it take five minutes? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you all later. Bye, guys.